Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's start, even though just 20 of you are here out of uh, 30. The others will have to watch then the video by themselves. So as I said on Tuesday, today we're going to divide uh, our lecture into two uh, different moments. Um, uh, in the first one, we are going to, I'm going to uh, go through um, how, um, what Heidegger says about identity and being uh, can be found in uh, Plotinus. And then in the second part of the lecture, as I said uh, on Tuesday, we'll leave the floor to you for you to ask questions or raise objections or observations, okay? So uh, without further ado, let's go into today's topic. I won't resume what we said uh, last Tuesday because you can find it on uh, on the video that I've uploaded. I will go directly into today's topic instead. So what is it that we're going to concentrate on? We're going to concentrate on a passage of the essay, The Principle of Identity. And by concentrating on this passage, we will see how what Heidegger says there um, is quite apt to describe and to grasp um, the, the, the thought of Plotinus. Above all, as this thought uh, has showed itself to us in the, uh, in the treatise that we have studied during the semester. So let's go directly to the passage by Heidegger. Uh, give me a second, how do we do this? Okay, let me try to share my screen with you. Let's see if I can do it. So, this is my screen. Wait there. Eh? Okay. And do you see what do you see a text? Can you see my screen? Yeah, I cannot see. Cannot see. You can't. Yeah, cannot. Oh. Uh. Okay, wait a second. Now you should be able to. Yes, we can now. Okay, good. So, let's go. We are at page one. Uh, end of page one. Uh, Okay, the last paragraph of page one. Let's read it together. The more adequate formula for the principle of identity, A is A, says accordingly not only each A is itself the same, but it, say, it says rather, sorry, there is a mistake. It says rather, each A is itself the same with itself. In sameness, there is the relation of with, hence a mediation, a linking, a synthesis, the unification into a unity. So in sameness, sameness is a unity, okay? Sameness is a unity which is the result of a unification. Hmm. Whence it comes that identity all throughout the history of Western thought has appeared in the character 
of unity. But, and again, unity means by now, Heidegger is using it as result of a unification. But this unity is in no way the insipid emptiness of that which, keeping itself as the relation less, rests onto a monotony. Here is basically reiterating the point. This unity, being the result of a unification, cannot be uh, just uh, the monotony of what has no relation. Cannot be the completely unrelated, okay? However, Western thought has needed more than 2,000 years before before that relating of the same with itself, the relating that dominates and emerges already in ancient time in the identity, decided upon and coined as the mediation comes to the fore. So what is he saying here? He's saying that this kind of mediation that brings about unity as a result of unification has been brought to the fore as an object of reflection in Western thought after 2000 years. That is to say, it took 2000 years since the inception of this thought regarding identity, regarding what identity is and means. It took 2000 years for this thought to be fully developed, okay? And what has happened in this development? Mm. Um, the fact that the same, the identical, has been once and for all established and thought of as the result of the mediation. The mediation of itself with itself. Okay, sorry, let me... Is that clear? Hmm? Before indeed a place be found for this coming to the fore of the mediation within identity. Hmm? So Heidegger says that at the end of 2000 years of tradition, what has happened is that finally thought has found a place for this grasping of identity. Mm. Then, for the first time, the philosophy of speculative idealism prepared by Leibniz and Kant has given through Fichte, Schelling and Hegel a place to the in itself synthetic binding of identity. Hmm? So where is this place? When does this place become manifest? In the philosophy of Hegel. Hmm? This cannot be showed here. We must keep in mind only one thing. Since the era of speculative idealism, it is forbidden to thinking, it is forbidden to thinking to represent the unity of identity as simple monotony, and thus to renounce the mediation which dominates in unity. Where this happens, identity will be represented only abstractly. Okay, later on I will explain to you why he refers to Hegel. For now, what interests me is that uh, all of you have clearly in mind what he's saying here. Are we on the same page? Yes. Okay. What does so, it mean that he renounced the mediation? Say it again. What does it mean to renounce the mediation? Uh, well, the fact that uh, you, you let the mediation go, I mean, you don't reflect on it. 
you can't renounce reflecting on the mediation once this development of thought has fully unfolded. Renouncing means that yeah, you, you let something go, right? We can't let go of thinking of identity as the unity resulting of a mediation. Okay? Is that clear? So this is the tr traditional, the, the Western philosophy way of thinking about the unity and identity. Yeah, Heidegger is saying that throughout the course of 2000 years, Western philosophy has finally come to think of identity, of the sameness, as the necessary result of a necessary mediation, okay? As a unity resulting of a mediation. And since it results of a mediation, out of a mediation, it cannot, it cannot do without the mediation. Mm. Since, it is res since it results out of the mediation, it consists in the mediation. What is Heidegger referring to specifically? Let me clear this up so that maybe it becomes more comprehensible for you. Is referring, as he says, to the philosophy of German idealism, which, as he says, is prepared by Leibniz and Kant, and then is accomplished in the thought of Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel. Now, what does German idealism state? What, what is the core of this thought? Put in simple terms, the core of this thought is that uh, being in its highest form, in its proper form, coincides with thinking in that being is the result of the unfolding of thinking as the absolute subject. What is the absolute subject? The human mind. The human mind which by operating on what surrounds it shapes the world as reality. Hmm? Why does then thinking coincide with being? It coincides be with being in the moment in which the human mind becomes fully aware of the world as its reality, as the reality created by the human mind. Huh? And hence, fully aware of itself as the creating act of thinking. Okay? This unity now of thinking and being where thinking is the unfolding of the human mind and being is the world as the shaped reality, reality shaped by the human mind. Hmm? Remember what I told you about reality last week, about the word res and realitas last week, the, the, the wirklichkeit, the, the result of the wirken, of the, of the working, right? This unity is the result of a mediation which is the mediation of the human mind 
making reality, and by making reality, making itself, and then recognizes, recognizing itself in what it made. Okay? That's the kind of unity of thinking and being totally determined by thinking that 2000 years of Western thought have reached. And this combination happens in Hegel. In Hegel, this process, this mediation, rather this mediation is a historical process. So history, human history, is nothing but the unfolding of the human mind, the Geist, the spirit, as it, uh, as it is also translated, which at a certain point, which is the culmination of history, reaches full consciousness of itself and of its productions. And hence, recognizes itself in its productions. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah, I think it's better. All right. So, does so, it mean on the right trajectory? So Although again? that uh, through this, uh, Western thinking has come to the right trajectory uh, in the thinking of that uh, same and identity, although it is not explicit as Heidegger mentions in the next paragraph. No, it, it is explicit. It is explicit, okay? The problem that Heidegger has is that uh, this connection between, uh, the, the relation rather, between thinking and being, the same, okay, the same of which Parmenides talks, has been thought in terms of junction, of junctions now determined by thinking, another time determined by being. Okay, that's the problem Heidegger has. Now, what interests me here in this moment is to uh, clarify to you what he is referring to when he talks about the uh, culmination of 2000 years of tradition. He's referring to that. Mm. By the way, let me open a parenthesis here. Let me open a parenthesis on the different, the two different ways in which philosophy and its task is understood back in the continent, that is to say, in the so-called continental tradition, and how it is instead understood in the Anglo-American world, the so-called analytical tradition. If you have listened to what I said so far, it should become clear to you quite easily that for the continental tradition, philosophy, as Hegel says, is history, is, is its own time is its own time apprehended in thought. That is to say, the task of philosophy is that to think always our time, our time from the perspective of the unfolding of the human mind as the creator of the world. Hence, philosophy is ultimately a reflection on history. And through this reflection, the human mind comes to know itself as the cause and origin of the world in which we live, right? So of our present. 
And by knowing itself as the cause and origin of any reality, the human mind also knows itself as unbound, as absolute. Absolute means unbound, hence as free. Okay, so philosophy is, long story short, for the continental tradition, a reflection on the making of history as the operation making of history understood as a making that depends on the human spirit. And this grasping of our of, of, of what we make in thought is necessary for the human spirit to realize fully its absoluteness, its unboundedness. Okay? Is that clear? This is very important, very, very important. Because it is out of this understanding of philosophy that uh, you can then understand the uh, participation into the public sphere that characterizes uh, the particip participation into the public sphere on the part of philosophers and intellectuals that characterizes the, the history, at least the, the last 400 years of Western history, of European history, okay? And the participation of these intellectuals has not limited itself to analyze the status quo. But it has worked as a stimulus for political uh, and economical institutions to be shaped in such a way as to enhance human freedom, the certainty of which, of which the certainty of which, the certainty of the existence of which has been reached by philosophical reflection. Philosophical reflection that has recognized the history to be the product of the making of the human mind. Okay? In the analytical tradition instead, philosophy is thought to be, on the one hand, uh, a sort of logical doctrine whereby thought is organized according to certain rules, mm, certain formal rules. And in turn, these formal rules have to be used in order to assure the correct working of the sciences in their deductions and in their methodologies. And this so that the sciences be as much productive as possible on the one hand. On the other, this uh, technique of uh, of logical uh, formulas and, uh, and uh, that forms a system uh, is used to analyze and to order the status quo. Mm. So the divide is quite huge. To, to put it in in a in a in a short formula, the divide between analytic and continental philosophy is to be found in the fact that analytic philosophy has completely renounced to think about history. Analytic philosophy is ahistorical. It doesn't look at the human being as a historical being. In fact, when you read an analytic philosopher, 
what strikes you immediately is the hidden presupposition that the human mind works universally in the same way in any given period. Hmm. Whereas for the continental tradition, the fact that the human being is a historical being and hence that the human mind manifests itself in history cannot be skipped. These different manifestations of the human mind in history uh, are thought of by Hegel as leading up to a culmination which is the culmination is the moment this culmination is the moment at which the human mind becomes conscious of itself as the creator of the world now let me clarify this this uh, thing of the creator of the world this expression creator of the world when i say that you don't have to understand that hegel or fichte thought that the human beings have made the stars and the planet earth and, uh, and the sky and the moon and so on and so forth or, or even the trees, the stones, the rivers. Of course those things existed before the human being and would keep existing even without the human being. By saying though that the human being is the creator of the world, Hegel, Fichte and company mean that uh, the human being is the one that gives meaning to things. That is to say, makes them be this or that. Hmm? That's why even in, in common expressions, we can talk of Chinese world, Indian world, and so on and so forth. What we mean by that expression, Chinese world, is the way in which Chinese people in the development, in the development of their culture have related themselves and have understood things around themselves. And this relating and understanding have shaped a world, a world in which a tree is fundamentally different than what a tree is in the Western world. Okay, so that's what I mean and what Hegel means when he says that the, 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 uh, the human mind is the creator of the world. Okay, is the creator of reality. Now in English, unfortunately, as I told you last week, you don't hear anymore the strength and the actual meaning of the word reality. And you don't hear anymore, uh, well, you don't hear anymore, you don't hear at all uh, the, the strength of the word Wirklichkeit. Wirklichkeit in German comes from Wirken. Wirken means to work, to operate. So Wirklichkeit, which is loosely translated in all other languages as reality, doesn't mean exactly reality. Wirklichkeit is the reality insofar as it is the result of a making, of a working literally of a working. By working, by operating on things, the human mind makes things be this or that. And hence being, hence being depends on thinking. Do you see what I'm, what this identity of thinking and being means actually now? Do you understand? Mind you, this is extremely important. 
let me give you a historically concrete example of how important this thought is. All of you have taken the core curriculum in the social sciences, correct? Yes. And all of you must have read Marx. Am I right? Yes. Now, a concept in Marx, a fundamental concept in Marx, is the concept of alienation. Right. Mm. What does that concept state? If one reads it simplistically, the concept states that once a worker has done his or her work, the result of his or her work does not belong to him or her, but to the capitalists, to the owner of the factory who in fact has not worked, who has not produced anything himself, right? That's how we can read the concept of alienation simplistically. Hence, Marx would say, Marx would say, oh, this is unjust. We need to let the worker reappropriate himself of his work. Mm? Okay, that's the simplistic way of reading it which is not wrong, by the way, but doesn't go deep enough. The concept of alienation, read in its depth, mm, says something more radical. Namely, what the worker is alienated from when he is detached from his work is the consciousness of himself as worker, i.e. as creator. And the moment the worker doesn't see himself anymore or doesn't have the, the possibility to see himself anymore as worker, i.e. creator, that moment the human mind loses the possibility to actually grasp itself as absolute freedom. Hence, the liberation from alienation that Marx is talking about consists in making the human mind, the human mind in each single human being, reacquire the consciousness of itself as the ultimate maker of things. This thought of Marx is possible only from within the, uh, the, the foundation provided by Hegel, which in turn, as Heidegger says very aptly here, is the culmination of 2,000 years of history, 2,000 years of thought, now, in which sense the, 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 um, the sameness, the identity, thought of as the mediation of thinking and being as we find it in German idealism, in which sense is identity in this case not just a flat monotony? in the sense that <clears throat> it is thought as a historical process. Hence, it is thought of as something that encircles something that passes through history. Okay. 
this is an extremely important point, extremely important. If it is thought as it is thought, as a unification that happens through a mingling with things through history, if it is thought that way, as it is, then it calls the human being all the time out for a struggle. It provokes the human being to possess himself as creator, hence to keep struggling, to keep fighting. If you go read the Phenomenology of Spirit, which is one of the most difficult books ever written, but also one of the most fascinating books ever written, huh? you should pay attention to uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the original title that Hegel gave to the book, and then he changed it into Phenomenologie des Geistes. The original title then became the subtitle, Mm. And the subtitle reads, Wissenschaft, der Erfahrung der, des Bewusstseins, Science of the Experience of Consciousness. The human spirit through history, reflects on itself. And by reflecting on itself, it thinks itself. It becomes conscious of itself. And this consciousness, in turn, becomes experience. Erfahrung. Erfahrung in, in German means the uh, traveling through. Hmm? Fahren in German is to travel. Erfahren means to experience, to, to travel through, to journey through. So the consciousness of this experience becomes a Wissenschaft, a science. What is a Wissenschaft? What is a science understood in its proper term? Is the secure grasping in knowledge. So the, phenomen the, the phenomenology of spirit is that moment in which the human mind, creator of the world, grasps full knowledge of itself as creator and hence of the world as its creation. And here you see the moment of the unity, of the final unity of thinking and being where thinking finally knows itself as thinking and knows itself as creator, qua thinking, of being. Okay. Again, the... the <laughs> lingering on this, on this point. Wait, I, I hear a voice. Do you have a question? Any case, uh, sorry that I keep uh, lingering on this problem, on this, on this point, but it's extremely important that you understand how concrete this thought is. Mm. In our world today, in the world in which you live today, there is no thinking anymore. And given the fact that the predominant uh, the predominant uh, current of philosophy is the analytical one. There is no, uh, uh, no reflection on history anymore. Now, if these two things, thinking as reflection on, on history, 
if this thing, thinking as reflecting on history, as reflection on history, go amiss, what happens? It happens that the future is not anymore the open field for human freedom, but the future becomes only the incrementing of the present. That is to say, 100 years down the road, you will have essentially the same reality that we have now, the same reality that we have now, just technically more powerful. And hence, also more capable of controlling, of limiting freedom understood in the sense of the everyday personal freedoms. Whereas 300 years ago, when these ideas on history first emerged, they fueled something like the French Revolution. They fueled something like the Napoleonic enterprises. They fueled something like the struggle of the working class that led to the Russian Revolution or to the Chinese Revolution for that matter. So understanding this is extremely important. We're not talking about vague ideas and, and uh, 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 logical little games that can be tossed against each other. What Heidegger is here saying is that in 2000 years of history, of, 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 of thought, a peak has been reached. And once this peak has been reached, a certain understanding of identity has been fully grasped. And this understanding of identity has to do with thinking as consciousness of itself throughout history and hence as freedom, as unbound freedom. Okay. It is starting from this that Heidegger then looks forward and asks, is this the best way to relate to being? And this question has to do with what? It has to do with the fact that Heidegger sees that the state in which we are today, the domination of technique that threaten, threatens to uh, uh, fix human freedom as the ability to impose its will on things and hence also on the human being, hmm? that thing is much, much probably the result of the understanding of the relation of thinking and being as we have seen at the peak. In other words, Heidegger is here asking again, does human freedom really consist in the fact that it realizes itself to be the creator of being, that is to say of reality, or does human freedom consist in something else, in something that reposes, that rests on a relation with being, a relation with being whereby being is not 
the result of human making, but is something that calls to human to 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 uh, to human thinking. Is something that advocates thinking to itself. Mm? That's that's the question that Heidegger poses, and again, this question is extremely urgent and stringent in the time in which we live, which is not different from the time in which Heidegger lived. Okay. Now I realize that I'm already going beyond the time that I had said I would stop. So let me stop here for today. We haven't touched how this has to do with Plotinus yet, but let me just give you a small point on which then you can, uh, I think, reflect by yourself and, and figure out how this passage has to do with Plotinus. We have concentrated on how this passage describes what has happened in German idealism, what has come to the fore in German idealism, okay? Hmm? Namely, the fact that the understanding of identity as the result of a unification of thinking and being has been established once and for all, okay? All right. And this means that thinking and being have been recognized to belong to each other, to, to be joined together hmm, with the preeminence of thinking through a reflection on history. Okay? So, German idealism, as I told you, and all of continental philosophy is a thought on, of, and through history, engaged with it. Mm. The kind of unity instead that Plotinus thinks of is a unity which is a historical. History has no place in Plotinus's reflection. No place whatsoever. When it appears, it is depicted in a rather, I would say, almost banal way as the theater of the world in which comedies or tragedies are uh, offered but nevertheless a theater it remains okay what does this imply does this imply that then plotinus ends up ultimately thinking of identity as the monotony that heidegger condemns here i leave this question to you and let's do this. Instead of me always, you know, uh, uh, bothering you with my uh, with my elucubrations, let's see what you yourself, by yourselves, can come up to. So the question is this. Hmm? Under the light of what I just explained to you regarding German idealism and why it is important and, and uh, what happens there in terms of the relation of thinking and being, in which sense they understand the identity of these two things, the unity of these two things. And in the light that German idealism is ultimately a thought that necessarily engages with history, hmm? all right? And given the fact that instead Plotinus's thought has no trace of any engagement with history, can we then conclude that in Plotinus, 
identity is ultimately coincident with some with with the monotony that Heidegger condemns here. That's the question for next time. Try to think about it. Okay. Now it is eleven, so I have forty-five more minutes. If I am I right? I have until wait. No, no, I have until eleven fifteen. Right? Because I oh wait a second. 11.30, okay. So we have half an hour. So I leave the floor to you. Now I see that uh, William has sent... Okay, William has sent a few questions. So let me read them out and, uh, and we go through these first. So, uh, no, in fact, let's start from uh wait 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 let's start from uh young chun is the world just the noose here the one that collects the happenings into a world no the world in german idealism and i mean uh, the most uh, received acceptation of the word, the world is, as we said before, the reality, the wirklichkeit, as shaped by the working of the human being. Okay, that's what the world is. Mm. And by the way, that's always the first meaning of world. Always. Even the so-called natural world is in reality the result is, is, is within the cultural world. The cultural world, hence the world that's created by the human mind, is always the first world. You need to think only of the, only of the fact that a, a biological, scientific, naturalistic approach to the things that we encounter, trees, uh, rivers, sky, uh, stars, and whatever, has developed within a certain cult cultural world, namely the Western world, the world of the European men. Chinese language, up to 100 years ago, didn't even have a word for nature, for example. Does it mean that Chinese, until 100 years ago, didn't know what trees are? Of course they knew trees, but they didn't see trees, rivers, stones, mountains, and so on and so forth, as natural objects. Hence, even the, nat the so-called natural world is always subsequent to the cultural world. And the cultural world is necessarily the production of the human mind. Okay? In terms of German idealism. We can contest the term production, and that's what Heidegger does. He, contest, he contests the term production. But however, he agrees with Hegel, and he couldn't, do, he couldn't do otherwise, that the world, the world, is always tightly linked to the human being. Okay? The point is how? Then, uh, in some, uh, so it's a creator in that it is what orders things into this or that. Yes, in that sense, it's a creator. 
Uh, Gerald, how is a tree in the Chinese world different from a tree in the Western world? Well, uh, as we say in Italian, ask a question and give yourself an answer. The Western world has come to see the tree at a certain point of its history as a natural object and further analyzable from the physical, biological, and chemical point of view. The Chinese world has never done that until the Chinese world came into contact with the Western world. Does it mean that the Chinese world didn't know trees? Of course they knew trees, but they see them in, they saw them in a different way. The ancient Germanic people or the ancient Romans or the ancient Greeks mostly saw the woods and the trees as the abode of the gods. And yet they had the same thing in front of them that I have when I go out and uh, in Tiumbaro I go to the, to the park, trees namely. But an ancient Roman, even just to give a more, uh, you know, um, a more down to earth example, an ancient Roman would have never thought to put the tree in a public park. He wouldn't have thought of a public park to begin with. Why? because he related to the tree in a different way. So, uh, the difference is in how you relate to things. Now, I answered this question just to, again, clarify something that, though, doesn't need clarification. So, uh, let me ask you this. I want you to ask me questions, but try not to ask questions that are banal, okay? Because if you ask questions that are banal, you're telling me that, A, you've not been following uh, for the course of these almost three months that we've been together. B, you really don't put in any effort in thinking by yourselves, which you should. You should think by yourselves. Then, uh, mm -mm. so William now. Uh, I brought my questions today are largely more aimed towards clarification of some vocabulary used in the translation with some edits to integrate what you mentioned earlier today. Is it correct to think of the context behind which heritage is used here as a reference to the historical tradition which you just spoke of? Uh, no, uh, no. I mean, uh, the thing there with heritage, all the, the, the vocabulary of heritage uh, is an attempt to translate uh, the various über eigenen, fair eigenen and, uh, and company, uh, über eignung, that Heidegger uses when he starts talking about the Ereignis. Uh, so I, let's leave a clarification, the clarification of this later on, once we touch Ereignis, okay? Next week, hopefully. But no, it doesn't have to do with the historical concept understood as, you know, what history has handed down to us as the tradition. In order to grasp the constellation on the basis of which men and being concern one another, what would this constellation specifically refer to? Well, the constellation is uh, what before we called the world. That is to say, being and men call upon each other. 
and they can call upon each other and they have called upon each other in different ways. Consequently, every time a different way of, let's say, organizing things emerges. These different ways are as many constellations. What is a constellation? A constellation is a certain arrangement of stars, right? Correct. When referred to what results out of the necessary correlation between being and men, a constellation is the arrangement of things. Hmm. If I don't know, if you think of the Japanese world before Europe, the Europeans arrived, how was this world organized? It was organized according to certain uh, hierarchies, right? And all these hierarchies and, and different ways of organizing this world point to a certain relation between men and being, a certain way in which being had called up on men and men had answered to being. That's why it is interesting to study different cultures in order to see what other possibilities have been there. All right. Then, um, when Heidegger mentions atomic age, does he refer to the advent of nuclear power? Yeah, that's what he refers to. Uh, progression beyond the early industrial era where technology has advanced to the point where in terms of atoms. No, it is, it is referring to the nuclear uh, era, the era in which we're living, right? And why does he refer oftentimes to that? Well, because uh, he lived the last part of his life in the, during the years in which the problem and the, um, the fear for an atomic war, for a nuclear war, was uh, incredibly pervasive. You have no memory of this because you are all born uh, around the year 2000, correct? Most of you are born around 1998 or even 2000, 2001. Well, I was born in 1979. I have clear memories of the fact that up to 1994, so up to the time I was 16, uh, the one of the main, if not the main argument of discussion on TV, in, in, in public consciousness everywhere, was the fear of an impending nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the US. So that's why Heidegger refers to the atomic age. Mm on the one hand, because it is the most characterizing trait of the era in which we still live, right? He also refers to that because it is starting with the uh, fixture of the atom that the immense potentials contained in science as technique have been finally brought to the fore. It has become now completely apparent that science in its technical 
uh, nature contains an infinite amount of potentials. And it has become apparent in the very fact that science has managed to do something that was thought impossible, namely unleash the energy contained in the atom. Okay, that's the other reason why it refers to it. But don't think that Heidegger, one, you could tell me, oh, well, but you know, uh, this uh, uh, segregates Heidegger's thought into something that is by now not relevant anymore. Because what is relevant in our age is uh, the informatization of everything, right? And nuclear energy has become quite a secondary aspect of the unfolding of modernity. You could tell me that. Well, don't think so. Because in this essay, not so much, but in all other essays of Heidegger, another word that he uses to characterize our present is the word cybernetic. Now, cybernetic is the word that they used up to 40 years ago, 30 years ago, to talk about informatics. In fact, I remember very well, until I was 15 or almost 20, the word used was cybernetic, not informatic. The word informatic has come to substitute cybernetic. But Heidegger had seen also this phenomenon as one of the main traits of our time. Okay, so long story short, though, when he talks about atomic age, he's referring to a particular trait of our era, a trait that manifests itself in the nuclear power. Okay, any more questions? You can ask questions also about what I, uh, what we've said until 11. Okay, Brian, I'm just wondering if this freedom understood as the clearing is to be seen as something that is absolute, to be valid about all things and is neutral. As an example, what if the world I live in sees other people as invaders and threats and thus legitimates my killing them? them is not all the rooms in the house of thought. Okay. Uh, freedom understood as the clearing. That's already Heidegger, right? Once freedom is understood as the clearing, it is not anymore understood as belonging as being the, the, uh, the property of an absolute subject. In other words, once understood as clearing, freedom is not anymore the mark of a sovereign. In German idealism, with all its elan, with all its uh, noble uh, tending towards freedom, in German idealism, freedom is ultimately thought as the, uh, uh, as the, the property of a sovereign power. This sovereign power being the absolute the unbound subject. But freedom as clearing is not that. Freedom as clearing means 
or calls for the remaining open in the clearing for all possibilities in which being can call us to live. And hence is exactly the opposite of closing yourself down in a room. Okay, but again, we'll, we'll come back to this next week once we reflect on Ereignis, okay? Any other question? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. I just posted it on the chat. Okay, let's see. The first world is always the cultural world because things appear to us already informed according to the culture from which we grow up in. Since things appear to us already in a certain way, how can we relate to things in a different way? How does one progress from, for example, the current world from which we live characterized by technology to the Christian world where everything is a gift from God. Hey, how does one do that? By, sorry, by dwelling into the clearing. That is to say, by taking charge, to, to put it in other words, by taking charge of what we most fundamentally are. And what are we most fundamentally? Dasein. Da is the opening of Sein. The open space in which Sein, being, can manifest itself. That's freedom not as the property of a so sovereign subject, of an absolute subject, an unbound subject, but freedom as the remaining open. That's why those of you who have taken uh, the monographic course on being in time with me, I told you several times that the word Dasein, it isn't so much a descriptive word, but in a certain sense, a normative word. Dasein shows to us the task that the human being has to take up. And this task has to do with precisely making ourselves capable of that freedom that we're called to, which is the freedom of being. Okay, does this answer your question? Now, in seeing, is this character of this da supposed to take some form of universalness? How can the differentiation across culture be accounted for? There is no universal or universal trait, traits in the da. Hmm? The differentiation across cultures is accounted precisely because of the da of this openness in which and through which the very same thing, the very same tree can be related to in completely different ways. So the only, uh, the only universal, if you, if you will, that makes all of us humans is the da, is the opening. Mm. 
by the way, Heidegger, uh, throughout the course of his career, uses many words to talk about this open uh, in which being and men call upon each other. He uses da, he uses das often, uh, he uses um, uh, Ereignis, die Lichtung, and then so on and so forth. But what is getting at, the thing is trying to grasp is, yeah, this, this, this open space, so to say. Then uh, is the emphasis of freedom in the US that of the unbound subject, since the laws, since the laws they have are oriented towards being unbound in every way possible? Yes, uh, in a certain way, yes. Look, all that has happened from the French Revolution on, so what Heidegger referred to as Americanism, uh, uh, Sovietivism, or, or you know, Sovietic communism, or Stalinism. So Americanism, Stalinism, fascism, the various forms of fascism. And when we say Americanism, we must understand the world in which we live today. Today. All these three things come from the understanding of freedom as the property of a sovereign subject. So Americanism and communism, Americanism and Nazism have the same root and fundamentally are the same. Fundamentally, they are the same. The struggle that we have seen in the uh, 20th century is not the struggle between freedom and slavery, between freedom, that is to say, Anglo-American democracies and dictatorships, Nazi or, or communist style. What has happened in the 20th century is a mere struggle of political power. But all these different political powers that fought each other shared in one same root, the understanding of freedom as the property of a sovereign subject. Then the sovereign subject in Americanism is interpreted to be the individual, but mind you, the individual insofar as he or she is the standardized manifestation of the mass. Hence the power of the market. Ultimately, the sovereign subject in Americanism is the market. The sovereign subject in the German version of Nazism is the people understood biologically as race, hmm? a race that establishes itself in political structures, the state. And the sovereign subject in communism is understood to be the people, but the people understood as a certain social class. So human being understood as the determinate product of uh, of society. Okay. So what you see in Americanism, in Nazi fascism, and in communism is three 
different ways of understanding what the sovereign subject is. But ultimately, they all rest on this notion of the sovereign subject and on, hence, on the freedom that belongs to it. And in Americanism, freedom means freedom of the market. And the individual in Americanism, no surprise, has now manifested itself to be fully the consumer consumed. Because the individual, the individual freedom that the Americans talk about is freedom of choosing what the market proposes. Mm. Okay. Uh, so you don't have to understand the unboundedness of individual freedoms in the US for what they say at face value. Uh, then in seeing, uh, but how can one person see one thing so different from the other? Is this arising for the, uh, for the sequentiality of things that come to view such that a particular association emerges for person as opposed to person, person A as opposed to person B? Um, well, look, how things come to manifest themselves, how things come to abide every time in different ways, this is mysterious. And yet we see it happening. We see it happening all the time. And we have entire archives that document us and monuments and blah, 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 that document us of different cultures and each different culture was de facto in a different world. So it's a phenomenon that we can observe. Then, uh, why is communism fundamental? Yeah? Um, we can, uh, yeah, um, I, I think I explained this, uh, communism, Nazism, and Americanism. Um, so I stop here for today. Uh, and um, I'll see, I'll see you on uh, Tuesday. So please, on Tuesday, try to come with answers to the question that I posed uh, before, okay? Uh, the one regarding uh, how Plotinus reads unity. And uh, if you have more questions, do post them on uh, Tuesday, all right? Bye, guys. Bye, Professor. Uh, thank, thank you. Professor. Bye. Bye. Thank you.